In Genesis chapter 22, I, I really was going to, to, to preach on the cross today. I, I preached on the cup last week and how Christ took the cup and looked in there and looked at his life that would have to be crushed for the benefit of someone else. Today I was going to follow up and preach about the cross and how he willingly went to the cross and shed his blood that the choir sang about so wonderfully well. What can wipe, uh, wash away our sins? Not a thing you can do to do that. Nothing, you, you can be as good as you um, think you can be, and it's not going to ever pay the price. The, the, our sin debt is beyond us. And, but, but praise God, God came in and met the place when we were at deficit, eternal deficit. God met us there. But I began to think about it, and, and uh, the Lord, I was going to begin with just a snippet of Genesis 22. And the Lord just told me that I needed to camp there and, and stay there a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind, would you stand with us in honor of reading God's Word? And we're going to read about a man by the name of Abraham and what God brought him to and through for my glory, for your glory, for the glory of his Son, Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. God tested, didn't say tempted, tested, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship to bow down. And we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, what a wonderful statement. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the, on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know, for now I know. This is the word experientially know. Please hear this. There's a lot of things in our Christianity we know in our head, but we are not living out in our life. There are a lot of things that we say that we know are true, but we're not standing upon those promises. There are a lot of those things that we say that we believe, but in our ordinary, everyday life, do we believe it truly if we're not living it, if we're not trusting it? If we're not believing it, not just when it's easy, but when it's hard, but when it's difficult. God has given us a counterculture faith, counter to everything that seems natural to us. And it is because it's supernatural. And that's where the beauty of Christianity steps in, when we get beyond ourself and live the Christ life. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide as it is said to this day in the mount of the lord it shall be provided by the way 
he sent him to the land of Moriah, to the mountains in the land of Moriah. You and I know of it as Jerusalem. And we know the sacrifice that was made on the mount at Jerusalem when Jesus became that offering for us, for the sin debt that had to be paid. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises that were told to us even before we were born, even before Christ was born. The way was shown to them. It was amen in Jesus' life. He lived the plan that was prepared before the foundation of the world. And Lord, we are the beneficiaries of it. So Lord, I thank you for salvation full and free. But Lord, I pray that we have more than a faith that will take us to heaven one day, but it will actually work in this world, in our lives today. So Lord, may we not only trust you for heaven, but may we trust you for abundant life today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. In verse 1, it says, God tested Abraham. God's in the testing business, but he's not in the tempting business. If you feel like you're led to do something wrong, that's temptation. God will never put you in a place to lead you to do wrong. But he'll lead you to a place where he'll put truth up here and ask you, do you believe the truth? And are you willing to go beyond it where you're not only say that you believe it, are you willing to act it out? Are you willing to live it? This is the word here for test, nesa, which means to prove the quality. When, my, when I think of this, I think of steel. We don't just let them make steel and put it into structures. It might be good and stand up beneath the weight, but it might not be. So before I'm going to put my trust in it, I want to know that somebody else has proved that steel to be worthy. We're going to build this building. Y'all talked about it years ago. I was in a church where they did actually the same thing. We're going to blow out that wall. And we're going to blow out that wall. And we're going to expand on the outside. But to, to make it happen where we don't have all these posts up here, they're going to put a steel girder up there that's going to hold all the weight of the roof. Now, I wouldn't let you come into this place for a skinny second if I thought that that steel would not hold the weight, bear up under the weight, so that we could go underneath it safe. We need it to be tested. And whether you like it or not, your Christianity needs to be tested. Will it bear up under the test of life? Will it bear up under the weight and the burden and the difficulties and the hardships? You may say, sure it will. Sure it will. Absolutely it will. Well, let's go a little further and let's find out. You see, in Abraham's life, God called him while he was living in what we would call today a rock, Babylon back then, the Ur of the Chaldees. God put a calling on his life, a calling of blessing. And Abraham was going to have to walk it out. He was going to have to leave the place that he was and, and, and without knowing how long it would take, without having a map sent down, without having to know what to provide, he would just have to trust God. And he began the journey. Y'all want to see the map? Right here is the Ur of the Chaldees. Down here is where he would end up in the promised land. But he took off this way and stopped. And his uncle died. The one that he probably leaned on and looked to for help. Someone who was proven in their life. So he then when he started his journey again, listen to me now, God took him exactly to the place he needed to go, down to the promised land, modern-day Israel. Well, when he was there, God got him there, amen? Then a drought came up. So he said, the God who led me here, who called me to be here, who, who, may, who got me all the way here, I don't know that he can provide me, for me 
So what he did was he left where God took him to go to Egypt. He didn't think God could provide. And by the way, when he got to Egypt, he lied. He said his wife was his sister. Listen to me. A half-truth. Be careful of following a half-truth. Be careful about being satisfied with living out in your life half of what God wants you to do. If you believe in him, believe in him all the way. If you're going to trust him, trust in him with all your heart. Isn't that what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge him. Acknowledge that he's God. Acknowledge that you can trust him. Acknowledge that he's got a path for you for blessing. And he'll direct your path. Well, he flunked that test too, didn't he? By the way, if you flunk a test, you're going to have to repeat the test. Anybody in school ever have to repeat a test? Was that fun? I, I got you. Study and do it the first time. Isn't it so much easier? Why don't we? Well, sometimes we just, we're just broken and we just flunk. Well, God loves us enough to bring us back to the same place. And he did with Abraham. Guess what? He flunked again. He flunked again. Matter of fact, this great guy of faith that we talk about, Abraham, he flunked many times. He flunked many times. What about the, when he was warned about Sodom and Gomorrah and what God was going to do in Sodom and Gomorrah? And Abraham started to work and believe and said, would you, would you spare them for so many amount of people? Sure. Would you spare them for less? Sure. Would you spare them for less? Sure. Would you spare them for less? And Abraham got to a point where he said, okay, we can deal with that. By the way, when the angel came, he couldn't find that amount. And Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. I wonder what it would have been like if Abraham had not given up. Listen to me now. Just short of the miracle would it have been that God would have sent revival to Sodom and Gomorrah we'll never know we live New Holland we're here where God placed us you're here because you love the Lord because there's a calling and you want to follow him and you trust him and you're you're leaning not into your own understanding you're here in this place today because you know God's doing a work are you willing to Follow all of that? Look, you're going to have to do more than follow my light. You're going to have to follow the Lord that the light has for you. I had to test Abraham. Now, here's what I like about this. Look what it says in verse 2. Here's the test. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Does that sound good? Come on, church. Is that reasonable? Does that make sense? Not me. Uh -uh. Am I going to offer my child? I mean, I might offer one of y'all's, but y'all good with that? Mine? You see, i got to make that decision for me. And he's going to hit me right here. And he was asking, he was asking Abraham do, to do something that absolutely made no sense. Would y'all please look up here for just a second? New Holland, are you willing to do in your service for the Lord that which makes sense? Are you willing to go beyond it? That's the question. Is it not? And by the way, I'm not asking you to follow me. Please know. I mean, we'll, go, we'll find this path together. I know God's calling on my life, but I also know I'm not God. He is. Amen? But we can figure that out together. But are you willing to do it with all your heart? 
and not lean into your own understanding? Are you, I mean, we've got Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 memorized, don't we? We know it, but are we willing to live it? This is what I like about it. Look in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. <laughs> Quickly. We're not going to debate this thing. We're going to do it. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and, and went to the place of which God had told him. I, amen, Lord. This doesn't make sense. I think from this moment, you know what he was thinking? I'm going to go and do exactly what you're telling me to do. But I'm expecting. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 and 18, tells us that he was looking for resurrection. He was going to go do exactly what he was told to do, but he was going to look for God to do something beyond what he could do. But God can't get to the part where only he can do it until we do our part of being obedient. You think he's starting to learn a lesson? Yeah, okay. Well, look what it says in verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. How many of you started out good, and then the next day you're like, I don't know about this. Three days later, you're like, well, I've been thinking, Lord. You know, I think from going from Beersheba to what we know of now is Jerusalem, it, it's uphill. It's not an easy trek, it's uphill. And as he's trekking and he's looking up there on those mountains and he knows where he's got to go, he knows this is not easy, but yet I wonder how many times he had to say in his heart, Lord, I don't understand this, but I'm going. I'm going to do it. Verse 5. Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship to bow down. And we will come back. This is private. This is for us. But before he went that last step up the mountain, I don't know if you're listening, church, but I hope you are. He was already walking in victory. <laughs> Walking up that mountain. He hasn't built the altar yet. He hasn't laid the wood on it. He hasn't bound his son. He hasn't put it down. He hasn't lit the fire. He hasn't taken the knife. But yet he's already walking in victory. Already walking in victory because he is saying, I still don't understand this, but yet I'm believing beyond my understanding. And I'm trusting God, my great big loving God. I'm trusting you to do a miracle in my life. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire and his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Isaac, smart fellow now. Some people have debated how old he was. Some say he was a teenager. I think he's the age of 12, where a young boy becomes a man. Some said he had to be older because he's toting the wood. Uh, when I was a kid and they sent me out after wood, you know, I toted it in my arm. But I wouldn't carry it that way up a mountain. But most of the time in that day, they would take the two sticks and they would lay the wood on it and tie the two sticks together, and they would just carry it up behind them so they could carry it up. That is in keeping with that, what that word, to lay it on him, means. But Isaac asked the question, my father, literally he's like, Dad? Yes, son. Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? This word, word means sheep. Where's, where's the sheep? Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself. God will provide. That's the message right there. Do you believe God will provide? So they went together. They went to that place. They built an altar. And his Akadah, 
is the Hebrew word, the binding. When the Hebrews and the Jews talk about this story, they call it the Akedah from verse 9. Could you imagine after he built the altar, after he laid the wood, binding Isaac and laying him on the altar? Akedah, the binding. Trembling. It's okay to trust God and tremble. Y'all listen? It's okay. How many times have you trusted God and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And walk forward trembling. How many times have you known that God was telling you to do something, but you were scared to death? And yet, you wanted to be obedient, so you did what God told you to do, trembling. But he kept going. And Abraham, verse 10, stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, now, in the grammar here, the article is there, the angel of the Lord. And every time in the Old Testament, when they are translating and saying the angel, the word angel means messenger, but when the article is there, they're saying this is the angel of the Lord. Most scholars believe this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the Son of God of the Trinity. He is calling out and saying, Abraham, knows him by name, Abraham, here I am. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know, I experientially know that you trust me. You know what he's saying? Thank you for trusting me. But I really, it, this is the Brian, the gospel of Brian. I think he's saying, hey, thank you for trusting me, but, but Isaac's not the one I'm looking for. I'll take that place. He doesn't have to be the sacrifice. I'll be the sacrifice. That's not his job. Thank you for trusting me enough, but, but I'll take care of that for you. A lamb slain as though before the foundation of the world. As a sheep is before his shearers, silent, so was our Lord. Did he strike back? No. Did he go willingly? Yes. And he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. They looked over in the thicket, and there was the ram caught in the thicket. Not a sheep, no, a ram. Much more valuable. God has his best for you. God has. I got saved when I was 10 years old. I came under conviction of my sins. My brother, the one who has cancer in the hospital now, my brother was saved when he was five. He remembers it. He knows how he felt. He knows what he said. He trusted in the Lord when he's five years old. I was 10. Can I say I was a little slow? Will y'all agree I'm probably still a little slow? Amen? But at 10, my parents still provided for me. If I needed a new ball glove because I was so stupid, I left mine out and the dog chewed it up, my dad would give me another glove. I didn't have to go work for clothes. They provided for me. I didn't have to go work for food. My parents provided for me. When I was 16 years old, I don't know why, but they let me have a car to drive. That was faith on their part, I guarantee you that. But when I was a little older, I wasn't trusting the Lord like a little child. I was out on my own. I moved out when I was 18. Lived with a friend, guy friend. We had been best friends for a long time. We rented a place together. But I started to understand a little thing, a few things. Now listen to me. I went back to the Lord and I said, Lord, I know 
I trusted you with my sins. But now I've got to trust you with my life. My life changed. I guess you could say I stepped out of elementary school and went into higher learning. It's one thing for a 10-year-old to say, I give you my life. But as an adult, it's different. And for many Christians today, I'm convinced that they're still living under the promise of what I did when I was 10 years old. You see, I think you have to know what you're saying and know to whom you're saying it. I'm not saying being saved again. Don't get me wrong. One salvation, one confession of your sin, one asking the Lord to do for you what only he can do, one accepting of his gift of salvation is enough. But there's a different recognition of it. God had been working in Abraham's life for a long time, but there came a point in time where Abraham said, I'm done with the junk. I'm going to give my life, my everyday trust and belief in you. One of the hardest things that I have seen is people today who call themselves believers, living a life, only believing in what they think, what they see, and what they feel, and what they know. They're too afraid to live of something that's beyond them. I'll give to God what I want to give to God, but I will not trust Him any further. If He's worthy of having your life, He's worthy of having all your life. The question is, can you trust him? Have you met Jehovah Jireh yet? Now, come on, I know some of y'all, and some of y'all are warriors. Some of y'all love to, I love the Old Testament word, fret. Y'all like that word? That's self-explanatory, isn't it? Fret. We got any fretters in the building? Don't raise your hand. We know who you are anyway. Any worriers? Do we have any people that says, I know God can bless Brother Brian, but I'm not too sure God could ever use me. I love it when people get saved, but I can never share what God's done with me with someone. I felt for years that I needed to, to teach a Sunday school class, but I don't feel worthy. A lot of you haven't met Jehovah Jireh yet. It's Thanksgiving. Why are you talking about this for? I am very thankful that I have a God who looks at me every day and I can take my life and give it to him. And as the book says, I can give my life a living sacrifice unto him, holy and acceptable. And I can, I can thank him for his goodness. Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, y'all heard of him? Operation Christmas Child, y'all been filling up those shoe boxes? By the way, we have 54 boxes empty. Somebody took them this week and filled them up. We met, we, every box has been filled. Everyone's been filled and turned in. Thank you very much for what you did. Those kids around the world are going to take that box and open it up and see stuff in it and say, amen, hallelujah, and there's going to be a gospel story in there. Billy, Billy Graham's boy, Franklin Graham, Samaritan's Purse, wrote a book called Living Beyond the Limits. You know what that book's about? He had heard the teachings of his dad his whole life. He had heard the teachings of salvation. He wrote another book called Rebel with a Cause. You see, because he was a rebel his whole life. And yet, when he gave his life to God as an adult, he gave his, his, his life as a child, to be saved but as an adult he said Lord here's my life use me God began to do a work in Fra Franklin Graham's life living beyond the limits and I'm not the only one that believes this when I think about all the people that were saved by the ministry of, of Billy Graham preaching those great crusade ministries I'm not sure that Franklin Graham wouldn't have a greater impact on eternity Agree with me or not agree with me, we'll figure it out when we get to heaven. But he's going to places that his dad never went. He's taking those shoe boxes you filled out, he's trusting God, and God's doing an exceedingly abundantly work. Salvation is going all over the world. 
living beyond the limits. Are you ready to live beyond the limits? It's a tough question, isn't it? How do you do that? One day at a time. One decision at a time. One step of faith at a time. One difficulty at a time. One pressure at a time. Will you fail? Take comfort in this. Abraham did too. I already told you. I mean, some of the times he went to the same test and flunked more than once. But yet he's the father of the faith. I hope you're hearing this down deep. Not just in your head. I hope you're hearing it deep that God wants to use you more than you could ever imagine. Wherever you are, whatever age you are, whatever past you have, you can still live beyond the limits. If you're, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, that's where it begins. If you're here today and you already know Jesus as Savior and Lord, but you do not know him yet as Jehovah Jireh, trust him. Tell him. If there's a step of obedience that you need to take, if you need to join this church, if you've been saved, you've never been baptized, come and be baptized. If there's a place of service that you need to, to, to serve in the church, we got plenty of places to serve. Do it today. Our Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you for heaven. We thank you for all that you're going to provide for us there. But Lord, I know that there's a life of faith that we need to live down here. And Lord, we're here, so you're not done with us down here. So Lord, in the next few moments, would you just speak personally to hearts and lives? Father, we know where you're working on us. To live the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. To live faith, just faith. Not by sight, but by trusting in you alone. Father, do a heaven work in this service. And sir, we'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.